Miss Linda Susano. I'm 52 years old. I was born in a village called Monlaco on the Blanche Shares Road. I grew up in a very humble home. My father was a farmer. My mom was a housewife. I attended Prosecco RC School. From there, I went to Blanche Shares RC School and I attended Five Rivers Junior Secondary. While attending fibers, you know, transportation-wise, I had to come up here and live with my aunt. There I met Lazarus, Selena, persistent, and he will not take no for an answer. So you buy my socks. When I get my book list, he will take the book list from my parents and he'll buy the books and things like that. And I just say, grow on you. But in the beginning, I did dislike him with a passion. But he grew on me after. She was staying down there to go to school, and they fall in love, you know, young people, and that was it. Yeah. I became pregnant at the age of 15 in Form 3. I then had a daughter. She had about a year and a half. Then I got married because she was just pushing marriage all the time. And I got married at that time. 26th of December, 1984. If he would go out anywhere and he see something I, he know I like, you'll buy it for me. You know, that is how, yeah. And, you know, we used to do all right. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a real bird as I knew him at the time because of football. We always had a rivalry with Surrey and Lopino in sports, whether it be cricket, football, whatever. So we always had a good rapport. I remember once when he saw me playing for Surrey, he came and he bought a pair of boots for me just to come to play for their side because he wanted to win. And seeing me doing that the power that it was, he wanted to get me to come to play for them. So he went and bought a pair of new boots and came and gave it to me. And we grew, we grew closer through sports. We moved right more like myself. We built our own home, and that is where you know when they are alone. So that is when the they kind of start. He will start using obscene language and stuff like that. They will hit him and the stuff like that. He started having affairs. I was christening my daughter, and while the christening is going on at mommy home, he's in the community center with a young girl. Looking back now, I realize he never goes after mature women, adults. He, he likes young girls. And that is where the problem came for the both of us. 14, 15, that kind of age, that is what he looks for. He knows how to play it, he buy gifts, whatever. When he started having those affairs, right? I knew I had to leave. And he found out I wanted to leave. And that's where it all started. Really bad. And he literally lit a fire in front of the door, away. And he had one under the house. He said he was gonna burn us alive in there. He took me away from my family. So I'm here now, I'm on his stuff. There came a time he really got sick. You see, God woke in mysterious ways, and he was sick for quite a while. So that's when I had to go to work. He used to hit the children. By the slightest thing, he would want to hit. He 
he will be beating them, doing them all kind of thing during the day. When I am to reach, when I'm ready to reach home, he will lie down on that bed and start to groan and pretend that he's so sick. All our money going, we did not know what he had. So we just doing tests and he started losing his hearing and stuff like that. And he left here. You know. So that was a good time. Because he couldn't hit. But then only the very first thing he did when he recovered, he hit. That is time I got a working, taking care of the family, or doing everything. Because he was he resigned medically on trip from the regional corporation. And this is where I told him, if you ever put your hands in here again, I go on. I did not know Larry as a violent person. I knew him in sport as a very competitive person, but never violent. I never seen any violent tendency in him. He will never hit you. Where someone will see you, understand? He wouldn't slap me in my face to leave a mark. You understand? In the early days, he'd have done that. But then he get wise. So he'll cuff you up on your head, hit you on your back. He didn't need to beat me. I will fight him back. But he's get tired of fighting. But he was so controlling. I wanted to study, he wants you to tell you what to study. Sometime I'll be traveling to go to work, and when I come in, he can't decide. He will go on the right hand side and come. There was a time when I was in my department, I looked up, he was on me. Do you recognize him? So they call the office and on the intercom, they have to call and say, Miss Selena, could you please come to the office? Something had happened, but I said, get me away from him. Go on, spend the weekend, your mother come in. And he'll be up there when I reach up there. That's how bad it was. Like he had to have me in his eyesight like all times. My sister was going to get married. I said, girl, let me get past the Brown to marry you. And all she did was give me an invitation to pass the Brown that morning. He kicked me all over. He took a cutlass and he beat me every part of my body. Up to now, I have kidney problems. You understand? He thought I was having an affair with the pastor. One of the supervisors of work, I think this could, you know, ride up on me and she saw my skill. She cried. Everything is my face. My face. She wanted to take a razor blade and strip my face. Told me that. Then he was going to get acid through it on my face. He had a police friend and he told that friend all manner of ways where he'd have killed me. Tell the friend why I told him, boy, lock up that man. He will kill her. And they said, no. It was only tabernacle, he asked. Well, I went to the police. Normal routine. Advised to take out a restraining order. We went to court. I can't remember the magistrate name and all the two of Your Honor, I snapped. I didn't mean to do it. And she wants counseling. I say, lady, I don't want counseling. I want out. The magistrate denied it and sent me for counseling and said, that didn't work. He said he did not want counseling. If I come back home, everything will be okay. I cooked, I did everything like a wife supposed to do. And then I packed the bag, for a working suit, some underclothes. I took my little son and I left. Well, of course, you know that time he's crying on the bed and he's sorry. And that is how we end up moving to Shalonas. When I came to know that they were having problems, is when he came to me and told me that Leonard left him. 
and every day he would come by me and ask to use the phone to talk to me again. Or he would come and ask me to talk to her. And so we had like almost every day since she he said she left him. But from the day I left, he used to say she have to die. He used to tell them, we have to die. He came by me and we talk, I prayed in my council him, asked him to give us peace and everything. And at one point I thought he was listening because he was kind of getting, you know, a little karma and everything. That Sunday morning, I get up, 4th of December, and I told my daughter I'm going to church. Phone ring. Mr. Lazarus. Can I contact you? Say, boy, I can't make, I'm sorry. I'm going with your life. Can I contact you? Say, I can't make, I'm sorry. And he said, hey, what? Well, if you have a man, tell me if you have a man and I'll move on. And he continued. So, being the person that I am, I say, yes, I have a man. I did not have a man, but you. He just questioned, questioned, questioned. And, and what, what kind, kind of man, man he is? What kind of job he has? I said, he's a prison officer. That's not true. I did not have any man. And then he said, And I told him there and then, I'd rather die. And then he said, You're effing dead. We went to sleep, and that morning I get up, I usually leave home at five. You know when you were talking there and you're not listening? That was me that morning. I put on my bag, take up the Bible, and my working clothes are lying on the bed. I read Psalm 1, Psalm 23, Psalm 91. And I can't remember what else, but I remember those. And I walked out. And I stepped in the road. How much you walk about? Fifteen good steps. And I heard this running behind me. And as I turned my head to the sand, you were sleeping. You know, you're not boring. I'm telling my wife, I tell you, you're not boring, but you're boring unusual. She said, I'm going to be in the van, 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 so when I run through this door here, I run through this door in front door here. I said the lady trying to run in the yard, but he, he blocking her from running in the yard and chopping on her. Like then I see she brushing hands one, I see chop the hand. The hand to the hand. Blood starts spraying. So she decided she had to run in the yard now. But That little entrance, that corridor, right at the side here. She forced him to come through there, but he's still coming behind. She chopped it now. But you can raise really the cutlass high between the corridor because the space too narrow. So as she returned to the end of the open, she fall down. Like she get weak now. And he coming over, she to chop the pinky head. My husband just saw this and get a big stone. Oh, he said, hey, what are you doing there? And the man answering, just keep pelting chop. So he get leg of the stone behind him. I ended up cursing him and felt a big stone at his face now, boy. He, he took and started to run one time. When he let go the stone behind him, he ran. So the big stone hit the house and bounced back. And started running on the road, you know, so next neighbor come up with a cutlet. So all I step out and ball, hey, what you doing? I tell him, are you going? Like you were somehow watching now, get there. And then he continued to walk away and leave her. But first I'll make sure that she safe by my neighbor, kind of watching her, see my neighbor come out and they assist her. So I said, right. So I was going behind the guy to see where he heading, you know, 
what is the intention? So same time the, the lady's son come and the both of us went. Well, I see he threw the cutlash over by my neighbor and he dropped his jacket. We run out on the road and that is the day jumping out and get out of it. Yeah, simple like that. And my husband just saw this and he brings you and put you to sit down in the back. When he put that lady to sit down, blood just spouting out like water, getting clad. So I tell him, I say, I'm going to call his family because they say nice. And she just, they talking like nothing happened. The man she up and thing wait for the ambulance. The man take a while to come. Go on with she. And when I looked down, I saw my hands just hanging by the skin. When I do watching in the road now, I see a piece of finger. See what? This man come to kill this man I see this way. My son was in the ambulance with me. And all he said, I'll kill him, I'll kill him, I'll kill him, man. I remember telling him and playing with his head, no, you're not killing anyone. And using the, the thumb on the right hand, it's cut off to her. And they had to dress that. And as he very said, I had to take it and rub his head with it, you know, because that's all he was seeing. To me, like that, journey was forever. And I remember when I reached at Paul Spain General Hospital, I saw my very best friend, Martha Bourne, and a few colleagues from work. And I remember as clear as day, all Martha telling him, don't cut off her hands, sir. don't cut off her hands. I went in the theater and I came out, and I remember asking my daughter, where's my hand? And she said, don't worry, Dad. Go to sleep, you'll get back your hand tomorrow. If I had to do this all over again, and I'd lose the hand, I'd rather lose the hand and stay with him. He was a monster. Because he continued cutting, cutting, cutting. You know how long it take for them to stitch up my head? They said 52 stitches. If I go to the hairdresser, there's only shake there because everybody's want to know. So I really stop going. Look at the scars is there. My eyesight is so bad because of that. Why they couldn't do anything for that hand? Because it's hanging the skin. I remember one of the boys came and they said, Daddy, and they told his father first because they don't know how I was going to take it. And then they told him what happened. So he said, all right, well, we have to go and look for her. And I remember when we went down to the hospital and um, we saw they coming out with her with, on a wheelchair from the ward, you know. And um, well, the father couldn't keep up his butts down into tears because that man that loved his children. She said, Daddy, don't cry. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. No, don't cry. I remember she told him that. Yeah, don't cry. Yeah. Nine o'clock next morning, a radio was playing in the back of me. The next section. And I heard Lazarus Salin had just died at the Herculean Medical Sciences Complex. And I said, thank you, God. Larry came out, then white panel bus, and he told us that he finished her. And um, he went by his mother just about three houses away and tell her that he loved her and give her a kiss and he drank somebody's substance from the bottle in his hand. And we saw him drink at least about five times. He put it to his mouth and drink. And nobody couldn't go near him because he had a blade in his hand. And 
When he drank the tap, they realized well, he cannot help himself. They went up the hill, take away the blade. While coming down, the police reach and they put him on the back of the van and carry him out. When I heard it, I was surprised because that morning I saw him walking down the road to go to the shop and he didn't look anything different. Oh, he didn't look anything different, so I really wasn't expecting something like that from him. When he realized I did not die, he put his hand in his throat to see if he could vomit the poison out or whatever. Well, I had to do another surgery now because the right thumb cut kind of slant. This time, I was so weak, so they can't put me to sleep. And they had this needle, and they searching in my right shoulder to find this nerve that I'll feel it in the middle finger. And when I feel that, then I could tell them, and they just chucking, chucking, chucking. It is one of the most painful, torturous thing I've ever been through. This losing the hand did not hurt like this spot. So when it got numb, then they went and they cut this. So you could imagine this hand cut off and this hand up, tied up to some kind of thing. You get bleeding and all hair is cut. And now, to make it worse, that time I demand come around. So that is when I cried because people have to do things to me. So when the pass urine, they have to come. I need to change a napkin, they have to come. It is one of the most, I don't know a word for it, honestly. For me to shower, I have to go like this. That's how it used to be. The officer who was investigating the incident he used to come like every day for the Spain General Hospital. You know, he was such a sweetheart. He said, beautiful, love, you know, and just a lightning moment. And he he, he called me for the years after until we lost contact. Just like the people in the ambulance, they continued calling and checking up on me until we just lost contact. I had this colleague. Her name is Miss Kashi. Every night she would religiously come to the hospital. And when I look up and I'm asleep, I will see her standing there praying. She never stopped praying, but when she realized, well, I will not die, that's when she stopped coming likely. My son, Godmother, used to come, that is Martha. And she would come religiously, and then she had an exam, and I told her, don't come back until your exam finish. And she used to be crying every day. Well, when I left the hospital, I stayed away from work 18 months. She took me in. When she had to work, her family and sisters and I will come and make sure I shower and everything. Her husband will prepare my meals, um, give me my meds, everything. I have known Glenda Sozano for the past 25 years. Um, she has always had a strong personality. She was always a determined, hardworking individual. From inception, our relationship just hit off. The friendship grew over the years and um, we remain friends up until today. The healing process wasn't bad. The phantom pains was terrible. And the therapy at the hospital it wasn't working. So I was in the gym before. So all I did, I just went back to the gym. And we started to put weights, strap on weights, of course, on her, and started to work with her. And is that what helped me 
for the phantom pains. I really get it now. It's only when I'm stressed, I will get it. But in the beginning, how much time I do that? You want to take, get something and you go to a hole and then you realize it's not there. But ever so often, you still feel feeling for the fingers and stuff. She is such a tower of strength that I feed off of her when I'm down and out. Could just pick up a phone and call her and you know my mood can change instantly. That is the effect she has on me. She's very nice and loving. She does talk to me. She works for me. So I think it's really me too. And she is a nice person. And we will talk at that time. We will talk about our ordeal. And she tell me that you have to forgive people. And from a woman who have come from very far. And she wants good for all women in the world today. She means well. I was abused for years. Um, we have four children, kick, cough, gun butt. That time they eat cough for them. You can't go to no, you can't talk to nobody. You talk to anybody. Uh, you deal with them. You can't go no way. Um, it continued for years and it keep on, it was just getting worse and I'll take it for at least 15 years. The abuse kicked off one butt. Um, he lights a mattress and put me and the portrait in behind it and said unless it didn't catch, he will not leave the house. And um, I keep on telling them, Olya, anytime, Olya's here. Your father doing you something wrong. He take up a foundation block. And um, uh, while I was on the ground, he tried and threw himself on me. And they had hold him, so he's in prison almost five years. Working with Glenda and knowing Glenda, she's a very loving and caring person. She shows you a lot, she teaches you a lot. Helping women, empowering women to be independent. My parents are gardeners, so I love gardening. So at most of the times when I get a chance, that is what I like. Working with Glenda in the back, there's a healing process. When she calls me, I will come and I will help. I will work with her and then. I'm working the land, even though I'm still employed. Lovely, quiet place. To me, it's healing. When you dare, the quietness, the atmosphere, you know, very therapeutic. So I went and I did about 18 certificates in agriculture. And then I realized it's part of me. And it was healing too. Seeing how far Glenda have came from, it strengthened me every day and gave me the strength of God. And it's a healing process. Been working out there and been working with Glenda in the garden. And you're getting to, to understand what really love is again. To love yourself as a woman. It is amazing. I really don't know many women who um, you could consider disabled who, who um, could accomplish what she has. And um, certainly you, you realize her disability does not um, affect her in any way. Emotionally, physically, she gets, she gets her work done. There are no obstacles. 
she spoke long and hard about doing the garden and, and, and achieving independence long before it really um, became a reality. And um, I am amazed that she was really able to get it off the ground. Now that um, it is off the ground, we are only here to help her reap. But she did it all on her own. Woman, the first touch, the first wall, the first cream, the first anything, walk away. Look for the signs where there are red flags. Just get out of the relationship before it is too late. It makes no sense because we will think it will get better, but it won't. It will get worse. And I, I am one of the few ones that get out alive. And I am begging to the young women of this country and to the world, once you see domestic violence start at a shout, please get out because we, we as women have lost lost in our lives through hands of some men, not all. The only man, and I didn't go to him for help. He heard about me because someone saw me and they went to him. Is Mr. Jack Warner. And out of the goodness of his heart, he issued a check for $125,000 to help me purchase a prosthetic limb. Truthfully speaking, I am functioning just fine without it. I don't need a prosthetic limb. So I told them to return Mr. Warner's money. How I look does not define me. Is either you accept me as I am? Not at all. If I could give the young women an advice out there, please. The sky is the limit. What is the rush? If I could do it all over again, let me. But I can't do it. But I wish and I hope the young women out there will listen. And you know, the Prime Minister said, well, choose your man wisely. He's right, you know. When we are looking for a spouse, we really have to choose. Domestic violence is an ugly scrooge in society, and we are trying our best within the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to get rid of this scrooge. The Gender-Based Violence Unit was launched by our esteemed Commissioner of Police, Gary Griffiths, on the 21st of January, 2020. We are asking citizens, if you see something, say something. Come forward and make the report. You can make the report anonymously through the 555, the 999, the online reporting, as well as the TTPS app. There are nine policing divisions throughout the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, and the gender-based violence is represented in these policing divisions. At the Gender-Based Violence Unit, we work closely with the TTPS Victim and Witness Support Unit. So when a report is made, there is support for the victim throughout the entire process. The Victim and Witness Support Unit has been developed out of that need for the organization to really bridge that gap between the crime victim and the police service, to be that liaison. So what happens is that we recognize that in the aftermath of a crime, a victim doesn't just go back to normal. A person doesn't get raped today or is a victim of domestic violence tomorrow and they return to work as per usual. But a lot happens in terms of the person's functioning. So the police service is offering this arm um, of psychosocial support to help persons cope with the effects of that crime or that offense while they are functioning in the investigation, while they may have to give evidence, while they may have to go to court, while they may have to revisit the scene and various aspects of the investigation. This arm um, of the Trinidad Tobago Police Service 
works alongside investigators all towards the well-being of the crime victim as well as pursuing justice for that matter. In terms of our services, so we would offer emotional support to help the person cope with what has happened. Um, we also offer updates on the investigation. So they may have made a report to a police station and they may want to know what is happening. We offer that liaison where they get information as to what is happening with the crime, what is happening with the investigation, so they know that something is ongoing. We also offer that liaison between the victim and social services. So the victim may benefit from a grant or some other facility offered by another ministry or another agency. We get that resource information and connect the victim with it so they are able to get that cushion, that social cushion to cope with what they would have been experiencing, right? We also know that after being a victim of a crime, you may have to go to court and court may be a daunting process for many crime victims. So there is where we would give information as to how to prepare for the court process or to give evidence in court. We wouldn't want you to continue to suffer in silence. We won't want you to be another statistic. We wouldn't want your children to have regret. And we are here to walk with you. You may not be ready now, but you may have a question. We invite persons to call and we can clarify. We could give information and we wait until you're ready. We continue to provide that psychosocial support even if you're not ready to pursue the matter in court because sometimes the information you may have about court may be unclear and we clarify it for you. So the Victim and Witness Support Unit comprises of civilian officers. So all of the unit's team would be persons that are specially trained in different areas of psychology and social work. So you can rest assured that when you come to the Victim and Witness Support Office that you will be receiving care and treatment from an evidence-based perspective and from a highly trained perspective. And this speaks to the investment that the TTPS is really doing towards providing quality service to persons that are affected by domestic violence. The survivors that may be watching this video right now or the victims that may be watching this video right now. Help is here. So members of the public, including victims of domestic violence, can access the services of the Victim and Witness Support Unit. When they make a police report, the investigator or the police officer can refer the matter to the Victim and Witness Support Unit, and then you'll receive a call from a Victim Support Officer. But you can also self-refer. You can contact us directly to request assistance regarding the situation that you're experiencing. And also some agencies may refer victims as well. So agencies can also refer someone that they believe can benefit from these services um, within the Victim and Witness Support Unit. And when persons are unclear, they can just simply call and we will give that information so they know how they can get this type of help.